Hi, Michael. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Rachel, for having me. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Michael Gilberg, and I'm a special education attorney representing families in special education proceedings against their school districts, whether they want more services, different services, or a different placement for their child. And I'm also a self-advocate who grew up with undiagnosed Asperger's, not being diagnosed until I was 18. Got it. So let's talk about that, actually. Before you were diagnosed, did you always feel that you were different? Absolutely. I always say that I felt just outside of everyone else, like I never belonged, like there was something missing, like I just never belonged with everybody else. Like I was different in a way that I knew I was smart, but I knew that socially I just didn't fit in. Hmm. Do you have any siblings that you grew up with? Only child. Got it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, sometimes lonely when you're growing up on the spectrum, so. Hmm. So you grew up in the 80s and 90s, right? Yeah, late. Uh, I was born in 77, so mostly 80s and early 90s, I would say. Okay. What was school like for you then? It was difficult because the teachers didn't understand me. The, the administrators didn't understand me. They thought that I was a problem. One of the school social workers told my mother to throw me away and forget about me, that I would never even graduate high school, and now I'm a lawyer. So I knew that I was more capable than the school gave me credit for. How did your mom respond when they would tell her that? She knew they were wrong and she didn't listen to them. And she was always been my biggest champion and believed in me even when others did not. Hmm. What kinds of services did you receive at school? You weren't diagnosed, right? But you were still in special ed. They put me in special ed. They didn't know what to do with me. So they ended up putting me in programs for the wrong for kids who were like juvenile delinquents and for kids who were problem kids. They didn't know what to do. I was bullied a lot. So they put me in like outplacements that were not appropriate for me. And so I never got real services. As I always say, I never got the education I should have. But I was able to catch myself up when I went to college and fill in the gaps on my own. And so when I got to college, I kind of became was self-directed to do that. Hmm. Did you have any friends growing up? I had one friend when I was, and we became friends when I was about 11, 12, and so was he. He was five days younger than me, and the same social worker who told my mother to throw me away and that I wouldn't graduate high school violated his confidence, told the whole class something secretive, and he never trusted adults again. They sent him back to public school and said he was fine. He was well-adjusted. The day before his 16th birthday, he committed suicide, and so I always say they failed me, but they failed him worse. Wow. And so that had a profound impact on me, showing how badly the system was broken. How did you deal with your friend's death at the time? At the time, I was so young, I didn't really understand how to deal with emotions about that stuff. And for some reason, internally, I hate saying this, I was never fully surprised. There was always something about him, as my mother even still says to this day. There was always something about him that you knew something was a little off and that it wasn't a total shock in certain ways. You know, I just moved on with my life, so to speak. Two years later, I went to college, and I kind of got my life started when I went to college, if that makes sense. The first 18 years of my life, I don't feel like my life was really started. I see. And you said that your friend's death had a profound impact on you. It did in the sense not making me depressed, which is unfortunate to say in a certain way, but it had the impact and it motivated me to make the system better for kids like me and him. Mm-hmm. And years later, I looked up the social worker who had failed us both to tell him how wrong he was, but unfortunately found his obituary. He had died of cancer a few years before that, so I didn't get the opportunity to say anything to him. Hmm. What would you have said? Uh, you failed me, but you failed him more. And to say, you know, maybe you should have been more attentive to your job and who people were. And with him in particular, maybe you should have kept his confidence my mother believes he was he was always planned to kill himself since he was a child from things we heard back then. But I do believe that the social worker violating his confidence to the entire class made him not trust adults. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to make meaningful friendships since then? 
Yeah, yes. As an adult, I have a lot of wonderful friends, some on the spectrum, some not. Some people who have turned out to be disappointments, but some people who have continued to exceed my expectations and been amazing friends. What have you learned about social skills and friendship over the years? Well, it's interesting because I'm one of those people who I always say, and some autistic people don't like this, I feel half on the spectrum and half not, because so many people will say, I don't seem autistic. I, you know, I can, I'm very natural in a social situation. So I feel like I kind of am too autistic for the typical world and too typical for the autistic world. And so I have a couple of friends who are in the same boat, which I think helps. But what I've learned is part of friendship is just, you know, it's not a ledger game. It's not, I did X for you, you owe me Y. It's, you know, give and take, but you don't have to keep a, keep score on who owes who. Mm-hmm. Can you give an example of a time when you've had to navigate an awkward social situation? I've had a couple of situations with people I thought were my friends, which I realized were not being particularly nice to me, and I had to stand up to them. And I've always been somebody who's been afraid of losing friends. And as part of that, I'm afraid to stand up for myself. And in a couple of cases, it cost me friends, but people I trust did say you're better off without that person because they weren't treating you well. And I've had a couple of cases where people thought because I'm on the spectrum, they could take advantage and they could push. Mm. Do you mind going into more specifics? Like what happened? Just people thought that they could tell me, oh, you have to do X, Y, and Z because you're on the spectrum. So trust me, I'm, I know what's best for you. And they were, and they didn't know what was best for me or they were doing it for their own reasons. Mm. You know, where people thought that I would be a pushover. Got it. And of course, you know, people don't always like when you stand up to them. Do you usually disclose your diagnosis in social situations? Yes, I, I see no reason to hide it. It's part of who I am. It's part of who you are, just like race, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, ethnicity, anything like that. It's the same thing. How soon into the interaction do you disclose? Depends on the circumstances, depends on the situation. I mean, I don't wear a sign that says I'm autistic, but if it comes up naturally in conversation. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just, you have to figure that out as you go. So what kinds of responses do you get now? Most people understand because I think autism has become so prevalent in society and there's so much going on with it in the media and entertainment. Most people understand what autism is, that they don't have to be like, oh, I've never heard of it. I think most people are find, I find do know what autism is and they have some experience, although a lot of people have misconceptions. Mm-hmm. What are some of those common misconceptions that you come across? So many people will say, but you're not like Temple Grandin. And the idea that every autistic person is Temple Grandin because she was the first well-known person being on the spectrum. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not like Temple Grandin. She's one person. She's not the template of all autistics. And I think that's something I've noticed other autistics go through as well. So I think that that's one example. I've had people say, you don't look autistic. I don't know what looking autistic means. I've had people say, but you, but you talk and you're bright. I'm like, okay, autism isn't an intellectual disability. So I think there's a misconception there that sometimes people think autism might have something to do with intelligence, which it doesn't, obviously. We are very bright autistics and very not-so-bright autistics. Like anything else, autism runs the spectrum of intelligence. Yeah. So going back to what you were saying about being kind of stuck between two worlds. Actually, you published an article in Autism Spectrum News earlier this year talking just about this. I'm on their editorial board after I had actually said to them that they needed self-advocates on their editorial board. And then, you know, it's one of those things where you make a suggestion and you would kind of volunteer yourself. <laughs> well, that's great. They listened. So they added me and they added a female on the spectrum to the editorial board to accomplish what I suggested the fact that every autism organization or publication needs to have self, self-advocates self involved. Right. So your article was talking just about this, like having a brain that's, you say, half autistic and half neurotypical. Mm. And I, I thought it was interesting that you were pointing out the continuum, like the actual spectrum, that you can't look at people as being binary, neurotypical or autistic. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. 
And I, and I actually got some pushback from that in the self-advocate community from people who felt that you either are artistic or you're not, and I'm, that I was wrong to suggest that there was this half in, half out. But that's how I felt, and I'm entitled to my feelings. Just that, you know, in many situations, I've met autistic people where I've been in autistic environments, and I don't relate to my to other these people on the spectrum for a variety of reasons. In some cases, they might have, as someone put it, more not the word impaired, but more challenges than I do, or their social skills might be more challenging. I know one autistic in particular who is a very big problem with boundaries, and even myself and another autistic friend have commented that, you know, even as people on the spectrum, we have a hard time with him because he's so poor about boundaries. And so, you know, not everybody on the spectrum is going to react the same way. And so there have been times when I've been in an autistic environment and I've just felt, I don't want to, as someone told me once, I had a thing called SB supremacy, this idea that I was much higher functioning and that I functioned at this level where I, I looked down on the other people. And it wasn't intentional, but it was the way it was coming off. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that the problem is that, again, it's a wide spectrum and you can go from somebody who is, you know, like myself or like some of my friends, very intelligent, able to function in society, have a job, have a life, to somebody who is very limited in what they can do. They have limited communication, limited cognitive skills. And the two are the two shall the two are very different. I once lectured somebody who considers himself an autistic leader when he said he spoke for these three girls. There was an article about a mother with three girls who were not who were in their late teens, early twenties, and they were very limited, nonverbal. They couldn't toilet themselves or feed themselves, and the mother was exasperated because she needed respite care because she had to toilet them and feed them, and it was too much for one person. And he said. He, he had no empathy for her and said, I speak for her daughters. And I said, honestly, you don't because you don't know what it's like to not feed or toilet yourself or be nonverbal. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's a big difference there when, you know, you can be independent versus somebody who is not able to be independent. Yeah. What did you think about the change in the DSM with removing Asperger's syndrome? and kind of redefining the classification of autism? I think practically it's not supposed to have an effect, but it has in some ways. To me, the terminology isn't that important. You know, it's like saying, are you blind or you're visually impaired? It's a spectrum. You know, there are people, I have friends who were blind, and I have friends who would be considered visually impaired because they have some eyesight. It's all a spectrum. The problem is I've seen professionals, in one case I had a client where this profession, where the psychologist tried to take away her diagnosis because of it, even though the DSM was clear, you don't lose your diagnosis. And what concerns me would be people who might be previously diagnosed and now lose the diagnosis because of the change. Mm. So they just they can also just go and get another diagnosis, right? In theory, you can keep going to psychologist till someone gives you a diagnosis. Mm. I mean. It, it, it you know it all depends if a psychologist is going to give you the diagnosis or do you mean an autism diagnosis or another diagnosis altogether? I'm talking specifically about Asperger's. Like when change happened, um, the people who were diagnosed with Asperger's before did they automatically go under the umbrella of autism diagnosis, or did they lose their diagnosis completely? Well, the DSM said that they were not supposed to lose the diagnosis. They were all supposed to go under the uh, the autism diagnosis, and it was changed to like level one, level two, level mm-hmm. three. And if I'm correct, level one is the highest. Mo- I'm looking at now is the highest functioning. So most people, anybody who had the Asperger's diagnosis previously, would in theory fall into level one of the autism diagnosis. Mm. And the levels are just related to how much care someone needs not functioning level, really? Well, it is, but it isn't. If I recall correctly, level one is the highest functioning. Level two is a mid-level and level three. Level two requires substantial support. Level three requires very substantial support. And level one is anybody requiring minimal to no support. Right. It just gets tricky. Like I know a lot of people are 
against the functioning labels and they don't like being called high functioning or low functioning. But switching to this, it is kind of the same thing like you're saying. It's just calling it something different. We all have things that we're good at functioning and bad at functioning. We all have strengths and weaknesses. You know, I'm not very good athletically. I, I'm, I'm clumsy and I'm out of shape and I'm not a good athlete. You wouldn't call me a low functioning athlete. <laughs> it's just that my ability, you know, we all have things that we're high or low functioning at, you know, it all, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's to me redefining the paradigm of what's normal because everybody talks about it in the concept of normal, but there really is no such thing as normal. I always say, you know, what I ask when I give lectures on self-advocacy and special education, which obviously is what I do professionally to define normal and nobody can define normal in terms of human behavior or human interaction. There is no normal. You can have a normal heart rate. You can have a normal pulse. You can have normal, you know, normal kidney function. But, you know, but in terms of behavior, there is no normal. Yeah, and I guess because society kind of defines those norms. Right. You know, we've decided certain things that are norms in society of what is and is not normal today. Mm -hmm. Right, and it can change, exactly. Things that were normal a hundred years ago are not normal today. And there are things today that are normal that are not normal a hundred years ago. You know, society changes on our predefined norms of what we accept as normal. Mm -hmm. You know, a hundred years ago it was not normal for women to go to work. Now it is. Mm -hmm. And we're better for it. You know, a hundred years ago, it was not normal for, you know, you know, uh, women to vote or they just got the vote. Now it's, Women vote in higher rates than men. Nor I'm using simplistic examples that I can think of off the top of my head, but norms change. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, 200 years ago in this country, slavery was normal. And we look back at that and say, how could that be normal today? Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's a great example of the norms of society changing. Mm-hmm. So what do you wish neurotypical people knew about autism? We've talked about the misconceptions. In part, I'll almost say that I think that I wonder if neuro, if there is such a thing as neurotypical, because neurology is so unique. Um, and neurology is so one of a kind. Um, I wish people understood that, like, like everyone else, people on the spectrum or autistic people are just looking for connection, looking for friendships, looking for meaningful relationships, looking for that same social connection that everyone else is, looking for romance, looking for love, looking for sex, you know, looking for the same things everyone else is, meaningful human connection, friendships, like I said, romantic relationships, just to be accepted in society. Mm. What do you wish autistic people would understand of neurotypicals? That there sometimes are things that you can't do just because you're autistic. That there are sometimes when you're going to have to conform to society. And I always use the example, you know, there are autistic people I've seen at events who go around touching people. You can't go around on the street touching people. You can't go around hitting people because you don't like that. You can't go around without, naked on the streets because you don't feel clothes are comfortable. There are certain norms of society we all have to accept as living in society. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something we all accept as part of what I call the social contract. How does autism impact your life today? Well, I think sometimes, I, I you know, socially, I might say something that comes off the wrong way, although not much less than I used to. I I get very anxious and I have very high anxiety, even with medication. I still have a large problem with anxiety and when people I care about are upset with me, it can eat at me. And so that's something where I have a lot of, as I said, a lot of anxiety that will manifest itself internally, even if not externally, even if I can, quote unquote, keep it inside. Hmm. How do you manage that? I try to manage my stress, you know, I'm, Better than I was when I was younger, but I'm certainly not perfect at it, and I certainly have a long way to go. What are some of your strengths related to your autism that have helped your career? 
when I'm really interested in something, I'm very focused. I'm very good at focusing. I'm very good at, you know, I'm very bright. And when I like know about a, a topic and I, I become obsessive and I become very learned in the topic and I have an amazing memory for details. I've done genealogy and I have over 8,000 people on my family tree and people are amazed at how I can just pull it out of my head and remember who's who and how they're related. Oh, wow. What was the, what was the interest there? Were you just trying to learn more about your family? Just when I was younger, I started getting interested and you find a little more, you find a little more, you find a little more, and eventually you build it out and you find other people have been doing the same thing. And all of a sudden you're in touch with thousands and thousands of distant relatives. And it's been very rewarding. My parents and I have visited and met so many of these distant relatives that they never, that none of us never knew we had. My mother wow. got to see pictures of three of her great grandparents she never had seen before. Um, and my father and I are hoping to meet one of his distant cousins. We recently connected with Jenny Yellen, the new Treasury Secretary in the Biden administration, is a fourth cousin of mine. Hmm. And what we also find very interesting related to autism is my father's mother's mother, every one of my great grandmother's siblings with living descendants, has multiple cases of autism in their family. Oh, okay. And so we believe that that line is where the autism comes from mm -hmm. because it is genetic and there's a, there's a large incidence of autism in that family line. And when you're talking multiple people, five, six generations later having autism, it's almost too much to be a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think about this if, well, first, do you want to have kids? Absolutely. Do you think about this? Like, does it come up for you when you're thinking about your kids' futures? Uh, I'm not there yet. I haven't found my nice Jewish girl. And unfortunately, I think, look, as somebody once said, you can have a child with any kind of disorder. You know, we, you know, there's no guarantee about any child. If somebody once said, you know, it's my, someone said something to my mother once about, children and my mother said you never know what you're going to get mm -hmm. you know my my you know somebody we knew who was adopted my grandmother made some comment about it and my mother said look you don't know what's going to happen if you have a biological child either there's no predicting what's going to happen when you have children whether they're going to have disabilities or not you know in many ways having children is a crapshoot mm-hmm you know, you don't know what you're going to get. So switching topics, Michael, what inspired you to become a special education attorney? Like I said, growing up, I didn't get the services I should have. And I saw so many things wrong in the system that I said, you know what, I need to make the system better. And I decided that that's what I was going to do. And I, you know, first I thought I was going to go into psychology grad school, I did it as an undergrad, loved it. I went to grad school, hated it. And my mother said, you know what? It's okay. I was 22 years old. She said, you know what? It's okay to make a mistake and try something different. And eventually I figured out I wanted to go to law school. I went to law school and I realized special ed law was my calling. You know, it's one of those things where I think I just realized I had a passion for it. And I was like, yes, this is for me. And I realized I could make a difference of, I could make a difference uh, in the lives of so many children. Mm -hmm. And so I started, you know, working, looking for jobs in the field, and it's not the easiest field to break into. And through a connection, I got a job with an attorney in the field, uh, and I started working for her for a few years. I got progressively more responsibility. I started handling my own clients. I started, you know, really getting it. And then I went out on my own and I've been doing that for the past few years, working for myself. Mm. How do you like that? Positives and negatives. I mean, the one I learned enough from her to go out on my own and really build a career. The one challenge to working on your own is you have to find the clients and you have to get word of mouth. And it's a little more, a lot of what I would call business development. That's not always easy for people on the spectrum, but I'm fortunately a natural networker and somebody who just goes out and seeks people out and one of those people who knows a lot of people. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's interesting you say you're a natural networker. Also, you're finding your genealogical network too. So when you were in law school, did you face any challenges or were you receiving any accommodations? Not really, because law school was kind of geared towards my strength. I mean, the only thing I needed was to get, you know, I was to use a computer on my final exams. And that was the one accommodation I got. But so many kids were getting that. It wasn't like a thing that made you stand out. Okay. Kids got it for ADHD and other disabilities that I was one of so many that nobody cared. And by the time I graduated, all exams were computer-based anyways. Okay, Michael. So you're based in New York. You practice in New York and Connecticut. So some of what we discuss next may just be relevant to students in the U.S. But Sure. Um, could you first explain what FAPE is and give a brief history of how students with disabilities in the U.S. have been um, recognized to receive this entitlement? FAPE is a free and appropriate public education. Every student under the law is entitled to what's called a free and appropriate public education. Um, you know, we, obviously, free speaks for itself, public speaks for itself. But most of the content, most of the fighting and debate occurs over what is considered appropriate. Everybody has a definition of the word appropriate. Like social skills, your definition of appropriate and my definition of appropriate might not be the same thing. Mm. So what are the standards that you consider when determining if a child is receiving an appropriate education? Techn under the law, a child is supposed to receive an, receives an appropriate education if they're making meaningful progress from grade to grade, more than as they call it de minimis progress, the Supreme Court said, meaning the child has to be progressing satisfactorily. Generally, that would be one grade level in work per year, depending on the child's cognitive abilities. Obviously, children of lower cognitive functioning are not expected to progress at the same rate as a typical child. Children of average to above average intelligence have to progress at least a grade level a year to be receiving, to, as a minimum, to be receiving an appropriate education. If the child is anywhere from low average to superior and they're not progressing at grade level, it's generally not appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you're just talking about grades, right? Well, academically, but then there's also the social emotional mm -hmm. piece, which is where a lot of autistic kids come in, that a lot of schools do not understand what is and is not appropriate. You know, a lot of kids do not understand how to address social emotional deficits. Schools don't. Kids who were bullied, very often schools deny the bullying when it exists. I used to use the hypothetical case of a kid who's getting A's, a, A's in a school, but then is depressed and suicidal, and then I got the real case. The kid's grades were fine. By his grades, you wouldn't know anything was wrong, but he tried to kill himself twice in the public high school, and the school realized at that point they had to outplace him. Wow. So, but it took waiting until they were going to commit suicide for them to do something about it. Well, until they tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem that, you know, people are waiting that long. Schools often say, oh, school, one of the problems we find in schools is, oh, school, they'll say, oh, the kid is just looking for attention or the kid is just faking it or the kid is just, you know, he's a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that a lot of the barrier is financial, like schools are not wanting to provide the resources for the for what the kid for what the kids need. Is that right? Correct. Schools don't want to provide everything costs money and schools don't want to spend the money. Because like anything else, it costs you know, the money is ultimately taxpayer money and schools don't want to be responsible for saying, hey, we spent your money on this kid. You know, a lot of families don't care until it's their own child. Mm -hmm. And so schools often don't want to spend the money because the school board is telling them keep the budget down. And every time you give services to a kid with a disability, it costs money. Mm -hmm. Everything costs money in this world. How much of a role does the government actually play and how school districts make decisions? And do you see a significant change across different administrations? 
Absolutely. We're starting to see a change. The, the, not to get political, but the Trump administration didn't care about this. Betsy DeVos, who was the Secretary of Education when she came before the, 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 set, the Senate for confirmation hearings, they didn't even know the IDEA, was a, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. She didn't know it was a federal mandate. Uh, the Biden administration is starting to bring in people from the civil rights community at the Department of Education who can, quote unquote, write the ship and hopefully start making a lot of this stuff much more, much more addressed. Because ultimately, if a school district won't do the right thing, the parents can go to a hearing. Or if that doesn't work, the next step is to, you know, the other steps are there can be federal oversight. Mm. But that's more for systemic issues on an individual basis. Parents have to file for what's called a due process hearing. Okay. So what are some common struggles that parents and students face? Like what types of cases do you usually work on? Well, a lot of these are social, like I said, social emotional cases where the school doesn't understand the social emotional functioning. The school thinks that the kid is doing fine because they say, oh, he's doing fine. He has friends, but they don't actually understand what that means. You know, they see that the fact that he's not fighting with kids in the school as friends, but he's not seeing them outside of school. Mm -hmm. So then do you go in and do observations or do you work with experts who come and I work do with psychologists, yeah, psychologists, behaviorists, speech pathologists, and I rely on the expert opinion. And of course, there are experts who are known as good for kids and experts who are, who are hired guns by school districts. So we, we often fight over evaluations to get the right experts. Hmm. So even the experts will disagree sometimes. Absolutely. I don't necessarily always think their experts are experts. Okay. What are some common misconceptions related to disability rights in the school system? A lot of parents often think that if their child needs a more restrictive environment or a different environment than the public school, that they're going to have to pay for it. They don't realize that under the IDEA, the school district can be forced to pay for a private placement if it's, if it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's a very thing. I've had how many, or they pay for outside evaluations that the school district could be made to pay for. Because ultimately, a lot of these things are school district responsibility. It's because not every family can afford this. And it's to make it financially equal for all families. And so I have many families who come to me, we've already paid for things out of pocket. And I'm like, you could have made the school district pay for that. And they're like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that I could have made the school, gotten the school district to pay. And you're talking about things that are five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So, but you work across a, a variety of different school districts, right? So, all across New York and Connecticut, right? I, met, I, like they, they must not all be the same, and just trying to save money, like it varies from district to some. Some are better than others. Mm hmm. That are more cooperative. Right. Depends on who their lawyer is, too, in large part. You know, there's, there's the same law firms over and over representing school districts. And those law firms tend to, you know, some lawyers are better people than others. Let's put it that way. There are lawyers for the school districts who are great people. And there are lawyers for the school districts who are horrible people. Mm-hmm. And same could be said for lawyers of families. Too. Absolutely. We have people on our side who are not always the best either. It's like anything else. Mm -hmm. So in what ways do you think the education system can improve their support for students with special needs? They can provide more focus on social emotional learning and realize it's not just about academic grades, that there's a whole other piece and that there are so many kids who are suffering in silence with depression, anxiety, and feeling isolated that they're missing. Mm -hmm. So what would that involve? Just more um, school psychologists having one-on-one -on -one therapy with more kids? More listening or? to the children. In many cases, they don't listen. What I've learned is schools will say, oh, even though the child says he's depressed, they're just looking for attention. They don't really understand what it means to be depressed or suicidal. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So unfortunately, you know, that's a big issue. The schools don't address those things. Mm -hmm. Is there something else in, related to socio-emotional 
um, support that can be provided. Like maybe the kid is not to the point of saying that they're depressed, but are there other types of resources like, um, I don't know, facilitating a social skills group? Well, sometimes those work, sometimes those don't. Because usually social skills groups are almost self-selected. The kid is asked to pick the people in it. So not, they don't always pick the, the right social models or what have you. Mm-hmm. It's more but could an adult choose? An adult could choose. But schools don't really do a great job with that, at least in my experience. Okay. So when you go in and you fight for it, what kinds of action steps are you looking for? I'm looking for the schools to address what what needs to be done to help the child emotionally thrive in a way that he can be a typical child and not and have friends and have a normal quote unquote normal life. And sometimes that's in the public school and changing what's going on there. And sometimes it's putting them in a private placement because sometimes I've had cases where the teachers have been so malicious towards the child that there's no option for them in the public school. There's no way they can get what they need in the public school. I've had a couple of cases with teachers abusing kids. I've had a case where right now that's pretty contentious where the kid is brawling mercilessly and then it's on video and the teachers are still blaming him saying he should learn to be normal. Mm. And this is a kid with autism. Mm. So there is a strong argument for the need to be more inclusive, you know, not just in schools, but in workplaces and society in general. Absolutely. Yeah. What are some pros and cons specifically of inclusive education? Well, it exposes both children with disabilities to quote unquote typical children and exposes typical children to kids with disabilities. So they see they're not different. They're just like everyone else. And I think one of the challenges is we spent so much time years ago focusing on kids in wheelchairs and blind kids, which are more obvious. But now you have invisible disabilities like autism, and people have less understanding of how to interact with those disabilities and less familiarity in the sense that they think that they don't know how they're like they don't know how to inter- children in particular don't know how to interact with autistic children. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely more exposure and education will help with the acceptance piece. Right. And it's teaching kids to be accepting of other kids, no matter what their difference is. Mm -hmm. Do you see any cons? In terms of inclusive education, only problem is when the kid becomes too disruptive to keep in in the environment. Mm Mm-hmm. Or if the kid is struggling academically and needs more support than the environment can give. But we can usually work with those. Mm -hmm. What should schools take into consideration when starting an inclusive program? The needs of both of the of the population as a whole, not only the needs of the of the typical children. Very often, I find school districts will say, "But we have to do whatever because of our typical children," as if they somehow have more rights than the children with disabilities. When both children have rights under the law, have the same rights. A school district has a responsibility to every child who resides in that district. Could you talk a little bit about what an IEP is for people who are not familiar? An IEP is an individualized education plan. It's part of the IDEA, which I mentioned before, the law related to special ed. And it's basically the document that outlines the child's education. It's the contract between the parents and the school district about what programs, services, related services like speech or occupational therapy and other interventions the child is supposed to get. So you actually have a very unique position because you are an autistic um, special ed attorney. So you... Correct. It's a rarity. You can speak from the side of knowing what it feels like to have to go through the school system and not have had your, your needs met in the way that you wanted or needed. Do you sometimes work with the kids directly or do you just deal with the parents generally with the parents occasionally i'll meet the kids but 90 percent of the time it's working direct just with the parents what do you try to teach students about self-advocacy that they that, that you need to stand up for yourself because you're you're always, you're usually your own best advocate and you're usually going to be your first advocate 
and that if and that the only way you're going to improve your life generally is to say what you want. Don't be afraid to speak up for what you your needs. You have a right to have your needs within reason accommodated as much as anyone else. All right, Michael, I'd like to close with one last question. What advice would you give to parents of autistic children who are just beginning to enter the school system in the U.S., like specifically around, you know, dealing with um, attending IEP meetings and knowing what their rights are? I would tell the parents, always remember, you know your child best. Don't take everything the school district tells you at face value. And if something doesn't sound right, question it. And if you need help and you need support, call an attorney or a professional advocate. We're there to help you. Very often, you know, my job actually, I find, brings down the temperature between parents and school districts where it's become a very contentious relationship. And my presence actually makes it less contentious because the attorney for the school district that I being, when I get involved, their attorney gets involved. And if it's somebody I have a good relationship with, we can talk openly and honestly and bring down the temperature in many cases. Hmm. Great. All right, Michael, how can people learn more about you? They can go to my website at www.michaelgilbertesq.com. That's www.michaelgilbertesq.com. And all my contact info is there, and I'm sure you'll put it in the description for the podcast. Yes, I will. I'll put it in our show notes. Just remember, for anybody out there with autism who's struggling, there are people like you. You're not as different as you think you are. And for those who are younger, life generally will get better as you get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great advice to just kind of keep your head up. Yes. It generally, it improves as, age, as you age. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Michael. Absolutely. Thank you, Rachel, for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. As Michael mentioned, failure to address a student's social-emotional needs can lead to impaired peer relationships, avoidance of interactions, depression and anxiety, and, in some cases, suicide. According to the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, social-emotional learning, or SEL, is, quote, an integral part of education and human development. It's the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions, end quote. More than two decades of research show that weaving SEL into the daily life of the school environment can improve students' positive behavior, long-term academic achievement, attitudes toward school, and transition to adulthood. If you're a teacher or a parent, you can collaborate with your school district in order to create a safe, supportive learning environment that allows students to thrive outside of the classroom. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.